Hello everyone. In this video, we're going to talk about working with usability data. At this point, you've been recruiting participants and starting to actually conduct your usability tests. So we want to talk a little bit about what to do after you have some usability data. In general, there's three different types of usability data that you might have collected. It is okay if you don't have all of these, but these are the main kinds that we want you to be familiar with. Likert scale data, task-oriented data, and open-ended data. So let's take a look at some examples of what these different kinds of data look like and how we work to organize, analyze, and ultimately visualize these data sets for your master's paper and subsequent presentations. First up, Likert scale data. Likert scale data comes in the form of ratings that use some kind of a scale, often a five point or seven point scale, such as strongly disagree to strongly agree. Here's an example of three Likert scale items. It was easy to find an example of how to approach a difficult patron, or it was easy to find information about a specific conflict style. And you can see in the picture, participants could respond using one of five responses. So after working with several participants, you might have data that looks something like this. Each row was a participant and each column represents one of the Likert scale items. In the individual cells, you can see the participants' responses, such as agree or disagree or neutral. To work with this data, we need to convert the text-based responses into numbers. Typically, if you're working on a strongly disagree to strongly agree scale, you would replace strongly disagree with a value of 1, disagree with a value of 2, neutral with a value of 3, agree with a value of 4, and strongly agree with a value of 5. This way, you have a systematic way to convert the text values into numeric values, with less agreement resulting in lower values and higher agreement resulting in higher values. Once you've converted your text-based values into numbers, you can start to calculate useful statistics such as averages and standard deviations. This can be done for each Likert scale item. So in the first example in this table, it was easy to find an example of how to approach a difficult patron. The individual responses were four, five, and three. In other words, agree, strongly agree, and neutral. Because we have these numeric values, we can calculate the average, which turns out to be 4.0 with a standard deviation of one. If you're not familiar with standard deviation, don't worry. It is simply a measure of the amount of variation around the mean or average. A low standard deviation means all of the responses were close to the average, whereas a high standard deviation means all of the responses were kind of spread out over a wider range. Once you've calculated your numeric data, you can present that same data in a summary table that looks something like this. This is a table from Shelby from the 2022 cohort. And you can see she is using this table to present the results related to how easy it was to navigate her instructional module. Her data is presented in what is often called a four number summary. The first column of the table is reporting the average, the second column is reporting the standard deviation, and the third column is presenting the minimum value, and the fourth column is presenting the maximum value that was recorded. Because this is Likert scale data, the lowest the minimum possible value could be is one, strongly disagree, and the maximum possible value is five, or strongly agree. Here's another example showing how Likert scale data can be analyzed and turned into a vertical bar chart. This chart is about average satisfaction and learnability ratings. The y-axis is showing the Likert scale values, 1 to 5, where 1 is low and 5 is high. The x-axis has three bars, one for each of Sasha's usability categories. The vertical bar chart makes it very easy to understand and compare across categories. In this case, the light blue bar shows the average satisfaction rating for ease of use was 3.4, the green bar shows an average satisfaction rating of 2.6 and an average learnability rating of 3.0. So that's a little bit about how to organize, analyze, and visualize Likert scale data. What about task related data? Here are some examples of usability tasks related to navigation. 
Task 1 asks participants to, starting on the home page, determine the number of lessons in the whole module. Task number two asks participants to find the last topic covered in lesson two. And task number three asks participants to navigate to and begin lesson one while starting at the end of the pretest. So what kind of data might result from these kinds of usability tasks? Well, you might end up with completion and time data. As an example, let's look at this chart for task number one. Each row in the chart represents the results from one participant. The first blue column is completion data and is labeled task completed. The data in this column is binary, either a one or a zero, where one means the task was completed and zero means the task wasn't completed. In this case, all three participants completed task number one. The second blue column is reporting time data or more specifically, the number of seconds it took each participant to complete the first task. Participant number one took 42 seconds, participant number two took 33 seconds, and participant number three took 54 seconds. The nice thing about having this numeric data is it can be analyzed. So just like we did with our Likert scale data, we could calculate the average and standard deviation for the completion and time data. This would allow us to report that 100% of participants were able to complete task number one, and that it took an average of 43 seconds to complete that specific task, with a variation or standard deviation of plus or minus 10 and a half seconds. This kind of numeric task data can be visualized. It could be presented in a table, or you might decide to visualize it in a vertical bar chart. Here's an example. This chart is titled Average Task Completion Rate Among All Participants. As you can see, the y-axis shows the percent complete, and the x-axis along the bottom shows all the different tasks that were part of Allison's usability study. In this case, there were eight different tasks, and the majority of them had a 100% completion rate. However, there was one task, represented by the red bar, that wasn't as successful. For that task, only two out of three of the participants were able to complete the task of resuming their progress after stopping and returning to the instructional module. This was a usability concern for Allison, something she decided she needed to address before she continued on with the rest of her evaluation. This particular visualization makes these usability results really easy to understand and to share with others. Here's a more advanced visualization of time data. This figure is showing the average time to completion for four different tasks. What's unique about this visualization is how the results are broken down by three different design iterations. In general, we want usability tasks to be completed quickly by participants, so lower times are better. This visualization tells a story about how each revision or iteration of the design made it easier and easier to complete the tasks. In the first iteration of the design, task one took 76.4 seconds on average to complete. This dropped to 62.4 seconds by the second iteration, then all the way down to 31.2 seconds for the third iteration. This visualization really showcases how Michelle revised her module to be more and more user-friendly by focusing on reducing task completion times. So far, we've talked about Likert scale data and task-specific data. Now let's talk about open-ended data. Of course, open-ended data comes from open-ended questions, which are questions that cannot be easily answered with a yes or no response. They usually require a longer written or oral response. The question is, what do we do with this open-ended data? Well, in general, working with open-ended data is a four-step process. First, we need to transcribe the data. That means turning the video recording or the audio recording or whatever you have into written text. The second step in the process is to code that data by identifying discrete thoughts and categorizing them by theme and sentiment. We'll look at an example of this in a moment. The third step is then to analyze that data, and then the fourth step is to visualize the results using tables or figures. So let's look at an example of walking through this four-step process. So here we have some open-ended data. It is a written response to the question, 
Is there anything else you'd like to share about the module? This is the open-ended response the participant wrote. For the most part, I thought it was pretty good. I liked the landing page a lot. The colors and images were very inviting. I did have a hard time figuring out what to do on the first lesson page. Some of the buttons were too small. I wish there was a way to search. Oh, and the introduction to lesson five was too long. So as a designer slash evaluator, what do we do with this response? How do we make sense of this data? Well, we can start out by creating a thematic analysis table that has three columns, a category column, a sentiment column, and a specific topic column. Using this table, we're going to systematically analyze each thought or idea shared in the written response. The first sentence is pretty vague, so that's not too helpful. But the second and third sentences are more revealing, reading, I like the landing page a lot, the colors and images were very inviting. I can now add these to my table. First, I have to come up with a high-level category. What are these thoughts or ideas all about? Well, I, I think they're related to the instructions visual design, so I'm going to create a category called visual design. And both of the sentences are positive. This participant liked the landing page because of the colors and the images were inviting. So under the sentiment column, I'm going to put a plus symbol to suggest these were positive comments. And finally, I'm going to add the specific topics from the comments, landing page color and landing page images. Now, continuing on, the next two sentences read, I did have a hard time figuring out what to do on the first lesson page. Some of the buttons were too small. Well, having a hard time figuring out what to do sounds like a navigation problem. So I'm going to add a new row to my table and label it navigation under the category heading. They were having difficulty, so that means it's a negative sentiment. So I will enter a minus symbol. And the second part was about the buttons being too small. In terms of category, this could go under visual design or navigation, but I will put it under visual design. It is a negative comment and I will add the specific topic. Then the participant wrote, I wish there was a way to search. Search is related to navigation, so I will add a new row and label it navigation. And because it's not there, it's a negative sentiment. And for the last sentence, the introduction to lesson five was too long. This seems to be related to the content of my instruction. So I'm going to create a new row with content as the category and negative as the sentiment. So now that I've done this thematic analysis for one participant's response, I need to do it for all of the other participants' responses. And so I end up with a larger table like this. You can see all the same information, but there are now more columns for all of the other participants. And you can see I've made this data numeric by converting it into binary, where a one means the participant made that comment and a zero means that the participant did not make that comment. So for participant one, I fill in all ones because that's the only responses I've analyzed so far. Now, let's say I analyzed participant two's written response to the same open-ended question. If that participant made the same comments with the same sentiment, I would add a one. And for all of the other rows, I would put a zero. Of course, participant two may have come up with different feedback. For example, what if participant two made a positive comment about branding by saying they thought the logo looked professional? Well, I'd have to add a new row to my table, entering a one for participant two and a zero for participant one. Eventually, I could do this for all of the participants and their responses, adding rows and categories to the table as necessary. In the end, I can total up this numeric data, and I might choose to present that data in a table that looks like this. This table is titled Participant Comments by Usability Category and Sentiment, and it breaks down the analysis of my open-ended data nicely. Let's look at each column. The first column is titled Total, and I can see there were 19 total comments, and 10 of them, or 53%, were related to visual design. Only three of the comments were related to navigation, four related to content, and two related to branding. The second column is titled positive and gives us analysis of the positive comments only. For example, of the 18 total comments, we can see that 10 
or 53% were positive, and 8 of the 10 comments about visual design were also positive. The third column is titled negative and does the same thing but for the negative comments. To summarize, a table like this is a way to organize and present a breakdown of open-ended data shared by participants. So let's look at some examples of how past students have chosen to visualize and share their open-ended usability data. Here's a screenshot from Sasha's project showcasing the percentage of positive and negative comments by usability category. She analyzed a total of 60 comments with 42 or 70% of them being positive and 18 or 30% of them being negative. She used the red highlight to point out that the usability category that worried her the most, the negative comments related to the game feature embedded into her instruction. She was able to use this data to conclude that that part of her project, the game feature, needed the most attention before going live. Another way to present the results of analyzing your open-ended data is with a pie chart, such as this one by Johnny. This chart showcases participant comments by sentiment. The chart makes it easy to understand that the largest category consisted of 39 positive comments. The second largest category was 29 negative comments, and there were eight neutral comments. Again, we can easily see the sentiments of the various comments he received through his usability testing. Now, here's a slightly more sophisticated example. It's a stacked bar chart that has two categories, positive and negative. The title of the bar chart is Positive and Negative Feedback Received Across Usability Categories. The y-axis shows the general usability category, and the x-axis shows the number of comments received. So, the longer the bar, the more comments fell into that particular usability category. Let's take a closer look at the top bar. This tells us that Allison received 34 comments related to instructional content. 19 of those comments were positive and 15 of them were negative. For the navigation category, she received 8 positive comments and 13 negative ones. Stepping back, this horizontal bar chart is really easy to read. It's an excellent example of visualizing usability data. However, it's important to note that stacked bar charts can be difficult to read if there are too many so-called series. In this case, there were only two, positive and negative, so it worked well. But if you're starting to add a third, fourth, or fifth series, it can be very hard for viewers to quickly make sense of stacked column charts. So use them carefully. Now, here's another way to showcase open-ended data. This is an example from Sasha who decided to share direct quotes from her participants' open-ended responses. Now, I don't know if these direct quotes were written down or were spoken during her synchronous usability sessions, but regardless, she pulled these four quotes about the usability of her instructional product. The ones in blue are positive in sentiment. I like how the layout of the page looks. And another person said, the interface is clean and organized. Sasha then complimented these positive comments with two negative ones. Do I need to watch these videos? And I am wondering where the escape room is. So, as you can see, using direct quotes can be a good way to showcase some of your open-ended usability data. Here's one last example from Johnny. It's in the form of a table with five columns. Area, comment, valence, that's another word for sentiment, evidence, but most importantly, severity. This table is only reporting negative in comments. And what we like about this example is how Johnny ranked these comments by their level of severity. He came up with a range of ratings from critical to high to intermediate to minimum. This was a nice way for him to look across all of his negative feedback and determine which ones were the highest priority. In other words, which usability areas were of most concern. An approach like this allows the designer to prioritize which issues to address through the revision process. Okay, that's all for this video. We hope it was useful to see some examples of working with different kinds of usability data, whether it be Likert scale, task data, or open-ended data. Keep in mind, you don't have to have all of these types of data. We just wanted to show you how to approach organizing, analyzing, and eventually visualizing the data you do have. The goal is to help you report your usability results, whether it be in your master's paper or in upcoming presentations. Thanks for watching.